All right, guys, welcome back. This is episode 16 of Home Theater Gurus. So today we're going to be going over speaker specifications and kind of give you an idea how to understand or read all those specs that you see when you look at different speakers and what's important and what's not important. So I picked a speaker, just pulled one off of the internet, and I'm going to go over its specs and just to kind of look at the different uh, parameters here that they're measuring and it kind of explain them to you. The speaker I picked was the Klipsch R28F. For no particular reason, just pick the speaker and uh, we're going to go over the specs. When you look at a speaker, often people just ignore the specs, which some of those specs are actually really good. They're not as good as a, like a speaker response where you see the on and off axis, but it does tell you a lot of useful information, especially when it comes to output and the frequency response or what you can expect. I do want to add a lot of times manufacturers fudge these numbers. They're not always accurate. Some really, really big manufacturers, maybe some that we're fixing to go over. So it's always advantageous if you're really serious about a speaker, see if you can find third party measurements. And if you can find frequency responses on and off axis, that's even better. Okay, so first we have frequency response. And on this clip here, it's 35 hertz to 24,000 plus or minus 3 dB. Now, if you remember the video we went over about what makes a speaker a good speaker, we covered how to read a frequency response graph and explain what plus or minus 3 dB means. It basically means it doesn't deviate from the baseline more than plus or minus 3 dB. So it kind of gives you a window and it's staying within that frequency response. Now, that doesn't mean it's flat. Some speaker manufacturers will purposely bloat the bass a little bit for a little heavy kick, but the thing is, that's how tight they're hugging their goal. You don't want any drastic ups or downs, so I mean, that does leave 6 dB of room there. You could have a quick drop and then a quick, you know, the negative 3 dB and then come right back up to plus 3 dB. So, really, the frequency response is still needed to really see how well this response looks. So this doesn't tell you the whole story basically, but it does kind of give you an idea of how low it goes. That's the biggie here. We want to see how low it goes because without the frequency response, we're kind of, we're not really sure what this response is going to look like. It could still be ugly and stay in that plus or minus 3 dB window. But this one's going down to a, a negative 3 dB point of 35 hertz, so it goes pretty low. It'd be decent for two channel. Okay, now while we're talking about frequency response, we're going to go on down a little bit on this page to low frequency extension. Now you see this a lot of times on subwoofers, sometimes on loudspeakers like we have here. It's a useless term. Now here it's not too bad because they're saying the usable output is just below the tuning frequency, so that's not really that bad, but sometimes you'll see a usable output that's 10 hertz below the tuning frequency or some silly measurement and some manufacturers will you know claim if you can hear a sound at this frequency it doesn't matter if it's so much lower than the rest of the frequency response that it's irrelevant if you can hear a sound they're going to claim it as usable extension so pretty much ignore that anytime you see that and it looks too good to be true you kind of need to wonder about that manufacturer and really do your homework before you invest money in that speaker Okay, then we have sensitivity. Now sensitivity is actually a really, really big spec and it's really important. So what they do for sensitivity is they'll take the speaker out into a field or they'll put it in an anechoic chamber, you know, if it's a really nice facility like Klipsch and Paradigm. A lot of the big ones have chambers they'll put the speakers in to design them and actually get the crossover just right and get these measurements. But those are very expensive, so not everyone has that. A lot of the DIY speakers are actually designed outside, which is nothing wrong with that either because the reflections are being removed and you're still getting an accurate response. So they're going to take the speaker, they're going to set it up, and they're going to put the mic three feet or one meter from the speaker. And they're going to feed that speaker one watt or 2.83 volts, but we're just going to stick with one watt just to keep this simple. So they measure the speaker with one watt fed to it and they see how loud it is. That's basically it. So if this speaker is 90 dB being fed that one watt measured at one meter away, that's its sensitivity. Okay, so let, let's say we've got two speakers. We've got speaker A and we've got speaker B. Speaker A is measured with that one watt at one meter and it comes back at 90 dB. So that is its sensitivity, 90 dB. So let's say speaker B, the same thing is done to it. It's taken out and it's measured at one meter or one watt and it comes back at 80 dB. So that's its sensitivity. 
Now, 90 dB is not super sensitive. I mean, a lot of high sensitivity speakers are going to be in the mid to upper 90s. And 80 dB is actually a, what we consider a power hungry speaker. Now, here's why. Let's say that we want to reach a desired level with this 90 dB speaker. Whatever that level is, it doesn't matter. We're sitting X distance away. We need to hit this dB level. Let's say it takes 40 watts to hit it with that 90 dB speaker. It's not super sensitive, but it's not bad. It's, we'll say average. It's got a decent sensitivity. So it takes 40 watts. Okay, this speaker B on the other hand, it has only 80 dB of sensitivity. It needs 400 watts. Every 10 dB of increase is 10 times the power. Now the next episode, we're actually gonna go over that and I'll show you how to calculate that. But as you see, speaker B is extremely power hungry. And that's why there's a lot of rave or a lot of people want high sensitivity speakers because you can easily drive them off the receiver and you can drive them to levels that other speakers can't be driven to even with amplification or separate amps. So sensitivity is definitely very important. Now in most rooms, we aren't listening at reference levels. Maybe we listen at 5 dB below, 10 dB. I mean, I listen at negative 15 to negative 20. I'm nowhere near reference and it's pretty darn loud. But reference is extremely loud and I don't personally like it, but some do. But in a typical living room or home theater, you're not gonna need anything really over a 90 dB speaker. Even a receiver or a good, decent amp that doesn't have to be crazy wattage is gonna do just fine hitting the levels you need with a 90 dB speaker. In the right room with the right type of room treatments, that 90 dB speaker can even approach reference depending on how far you're sitting and you know with some good amplification behind it. Okay, so that covers sensitivity. Now we're gonna go over power handling. So let's look at what this clips here says for power handling. It says 150 and 600 watts. 150 is continuous, 600 watts, that's the peak. So basically what they're saying is 150 watts, it's fine to play under that type of condition all day long. Now this doesn't mean that this speaker needs a 150 watt amplifier. It doesn't mean that whatsoever. We see that a lot of times on Facebook and AVS where people have a speaker that's rated for a certain wattage and they think they have to have an amp that matches. No, not at all. Your speaker is only going to require the watts it needs to hit your desired levels. If you're only using 60 watts, there's no reason to have more than that. Now you do need some headroom, you know, for those peaks that are going to happen in movies. So it's good to have, you know, 3 dB of headroom and that's twice as the power. So if you're using 50 watts, you may want to have 100 watts available. And that's going to give you a good bit of headroom for those dynamics and the peaks. But the power handling is not a goal. That's not something you should try to reach and it doesn't in any way mean that your speaker needs that much power to perform well. As a matter of fact, you know, with this speaker here that's 150 watts continuous, if we had it on a 100 watt amplifier and we never required more than that 100 watts, even with peaks, say we only needed 50 every once in a while, we had a peak where maybe the 100 was useful, I mean, we could have a 1000 watt amp on it, it's still not gonna use any more than that 50 watts in those 100 watt peaks. That's all it's ever gonna use because our levels don't require more power. Remember, the power has to do with sensitivity. A sensitive speaker is not going to require as much power. What the power handling does tell you, though, it tells you the thermal and mechanical limits. You know, you have drivers that are having to move back and forth on motors, basically, that are forcing them to move. So that's what the power handling is telling you. It's saying, like in this speaker here, this clips, it's saying, hey, I can handle 600 watts, but not continuous. You know, if you had it at such high levels that it was continuously being pushed that hard, you know, it may not mechanically break, but thermally you're gonna have issues. And that's why this particular speaker is saying, hey, I can run at 150 all day. I don't need to be pushed past that except for maybe peaks. And that's just a way of keeping you safe or keeping you from hurting the drivers and tearing up your gear. Now that doesn't mean that having an amp that's over the 150 watt continuous rating is a bad thing. 
like I said, if you don't go over that, you know, if your levels aren't requiring more power than that, you're never going to use more power than that. So it's okay to have it on a 200 watt per channel lamp. It's not going to hurt a thing. It all has to do with your levels. And we're going to go over that in the next episode, how to calculate how much power you need to hit your desired levels. So think of power handling as a speed limit, kind of, or a point that you shouldn't push your speakers past. Okay, and then we have crossover frequency. So in the comm world, we use 1K as the meat of the vocals. If you took all of the vocals, female and male, and you had to say, this is where the majority of the vocals are at. That's 1K. So that's a good reference to see what's handling the majority of your vocals. So in this clip here, we have two mid bass or two woofers, two woofer drivers, and we have a compression driver. So we have a crossover between the two woofers and the compression driver or the tweeter. Compression driver is just another name. It's the type of tweeter the speaker uses. The crossover point is 1800 hertz. So knowing what we know about 1000 hertz, we know that this speaker that's crossed at 1800 hertz, those woofers are handling the majority of the vocals. I mean, we're well above 1K, we're almost at 2K here. So I mean, 1800 hertz and down, everything is in those woofers. Those vocals are not coming out of that tweeter they're coming out of the woofers. Now you're gonna have some information in the tweeter, but not much at all. So this is something also good to know, like if you're gonna have these for mains, you wanna make sure that your feet aren't gonna, you know, when reclined, aren't gonna block the woofers because those are gonna be your vocals. You wouldn't wanna use these as surrounds or rears because chances are the vocal is gonna be getting shot right into the couch. Even if that compression driver or that tweeter is at ear level, you know, that's not where your vocals are coming from. So crossover frequency is important. And then we have impedance. Impedance is just your ohms, you know, eight ohms, six ohms, four ohms, and that is just a measure of resistance. So the less resistance we have, the more power your amp's gonna put out. So if you're eight ohms, maybe your amp can put out 200 watts. If you're six ohms, there's less resistance. And so now you're gonna have more watts available from your amp. But you have to be careful because it puts more stress on your amp. Not all amps can go down to say four ohms. You know, some receivers will shut down. You know, some weren't rated that low. So that's something you need to be aware of too. If you see a four ohm speaker, make sure your receiver can handle a four ohm speaker. All right guys, so that's pretty much gonna wrap up speaker specifications and kind of a general shotgun method of what they all mean. Like I said, in the next episode, we're gonna learn how to take this information and calculate how much power we need to hit our desired levels at our seats. So if you see a link right here, that means the next video is already out. So go ahead and click on it if you wanna learn how to calculate the power you need to hit your desired levels. All right, guys, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you know the next videos come out. And don't forget to check the description for this episode's cool gadget. That's gonna be it for this one, guys. I'll see you next time.